Orgasmic Enlightenment, where the sexual and spiritual come together. I'm Kim Anami, and I'm a holistic sex and relationship coach and a vaginal weightlifter. In this show, we explore all things intimate. I believe that our sexual energy is life force, creative energy, and we can use it to shape our worlds, strengthen our relationships, and self-actualize. I blend the most avant-garde information from neuroscience, ancient sexual practices like Tantra and Taoism to renegade wellness modalities to show you how to create gourmet sex in your lives. Come one, come all. Questions to ask your OBGYN. It can be tough to find the right person to help you with your intimate health and to provide prenatal and birth care. Use this handy guide to interview a potential candidate. I have touched on the state of current OBGYN practices in the Western world in a couple of other podcasts, which I suggest you also check out. One is SOS, Save Our Reproductive Organs, and the other is Don't Take It Lying Down or Don't Just Lie There and Take It. I think I might have titled it both in two different places. So my work is all about helping people to find and restore their own true power and their ability to heal themselves. The Western medical model is the opposite of this. It takes power away from people and it makes them reliant on an outside authority or a drug or a lifetime worth of drugs. Nowhere do we see this more profoundly than in the realm of women's reproductive health. From an early age, girls and women are taught that their bodily functions are shameful, inconvenient, and a massive pain in the ass. And the Western medical message is, hey, why don't you let us handle that for you? Sounds a little bit too tough for you, little girl, no matter what your age is. And there's a clear financial agenda with this as well. Women's reproductive care used to lay in the hands and vaginas of women, typically midwives. And at the turn of the last century, there was a series of orchestrated smear campaigns against midwives to try to get people, women people, into hospitals to have their babies rather than at home with midwives. And so the home birth rate used to be 99% at that time. And then in the mid-1950s, it was around 50%, and now it's 1%. So these smear campaigns that they had were like posting pictures of old, decrepit-looking women (laughs) and saying, would you want this weird woman to birth your baby and, you know, like outright smear campaigns, which they basically still do to this day, just a little more sophisticated. This is a quote from a Dr. Hodge in 1938 that really confirms this agenda. He says, If these facts can be substantiated, if this information can be promulgated, if females can be induced to believe that their sufferings will be diminished or shortened and their lives and those of their offspring safer in the hands of the profession, there will be no further difficulty in establishing the universal practice of obstetrics. All the prejudices of the most ignorant and nervous female, all the innate and acquired feelings of delicacy, so characteristics of the sex, will afford no obstacle to the employment of male practitioners. So one of the biggest problems with this, the whole fucking thing is problematic, but is that a woman's sexual power is one of the most important gifts she has to shape her life and her world with. And birth is, if not the, one of at least, the most formative and life-altering experiences that a woman has access to. When a birth is allowed to progress as a natural physiological experience, this thing that women, females of every species have been doing since time began since we had we were in existence this is an amazing life-changing opportunity for women and you know in ancient traditions like let's say in the first nations tradition in north america women were known to have their menstrual cycles and birth as ways to transform themselves guys had to do vision quests and do sweat lodges because they didn't have access to this. So guys had to do a bunch of drugs and stuff, but women just had to have their periods and have babies. And so 
what's happened is this systematic removal of this knowledge, of this power from women and put into the hands of supposed authorities. And so I want to make it clear that I'm not blaming any women who have been in positions of trusting and believing these so-called experts. You've done the best that you can. You have gone to who is meant to be expert in these areas and taken this advice. And so who I do blame are those people. So the medical profession, OBGYNs, but I certainly do not blame women who've been in a position where they might have been given misinformation or under, you know, not understanding the depth of what's going on here to remove this energy and knowledge from women themselves. So I'm going to be focusing on women's reproductive health, specifically birth and pregnancy in the coming weeks. So I suggest that you listen to all of these so that I can unpack all of this stuff in depth. And if you really are looking for a new OBGYN or you're in the market for someone to be part of your birth process, then I encourage you to print out this list of following questions, walk in and demand they answer you. If you'd like to download these questions as a PDF from my website, so you really can use them and share them with the world, I've included a short link for the post in the description of this episode. Or you can just go online and search for the post with questions to ask your OBGYN by Kim and Nami. So here we go. First question. Have you ever actually healed a woman, i.e. cured her without taking out her internal organs, that doesn't count, or giving her drugs to mask her symptoms? Nope, not healing. I've noticed that it's really trendy these days to cut out women's uteruses, ovaries, and cervixes. Do you think this is a trend that we ought to keep running with? Question three, do you receive any kind of financial kickback for the organ tissue that you remove from women during these procedures? If so, how much per body part? It's been said that the birth control pill and hormonal birth control is the lazy OBGYN's cure-all. What do you think? Organ removal comes in second as the answer to everything. Are women really better off without their body parts? How much do you make in commission and affiliate sales from promoting drugs such as hormonal birth control and menopause type hormones to women and keeping them on this medication for their entire lives? This sounds like an amazing revenue source. How many hundreds of women did you rape when they were unconscious while doing your practicum as an OBGYN or medical resident? Do you think it's okay for dozens or even hundreds of students to be marched into the operating room of some random woman who has no idea what is happening because she was never informed about it and so could never consent and while she is unconscious under anesthesia and one by one all of you shove your hands inside of her? Do you think this sets a dangerous precedent for treating women and their body parts as non-sentient beings? Or do you actually think this is essential training for how to look at women and their bodies in general as objects to be used, ignored, and overrided without their input? So I'm going to unpack this one for you. This is standard practice. It's been outlawed now in Canada and in several, well, actually only a handful of U.S. states, meaning it's still legal in most all of them. It's not talked about, I can't imagine why, and it's this dirty secret that's long been kept behind closed doors. And there have been a few whistleblowers in recent years who've brought this practice to light. (laughs) It never um, sat well with them, and so they came out to talk about it. One of them, Dr. Sean Barnes, was part of a graduating medical class where he and his 60 or so classmates collectively performed approximately 6,000, quote, pelvic exams on unconscious women amongst them or around 100 each. So the definition of rape is sexual contact without consent or without the ability to consent. This practice is rape and like I said it sets the tone for women and their reproductive organs being these passive unconscious entities. Amy Jo Goddard was, is making a documentary on this called At Your Cervix, and last I knew it was still in progress. I don't think it's come out yet. So let's turn our attention now to pregnancy and birth. All right, question. How much money do you make for a vaginal birth? 
How much do you make for a C-section? From my research, a C-section is double the cost of a vaginal birth, and it looks like you get $50,000 per C-section and $30,000 for a vaginal delivery. Do you see any conflict of interest there, and is there any relationship to this dollar figure and you encouraging women to schedule C-sections? The statistics say that most hospital births happen between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. from Monday to Friday. That is so interesting. I wonder if that has anything to do with OBGYNs like you wanting women to schedule their C-section so they don't happen at an inconvenient time like, say, 2 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of your golf game. Do you think there is any merit in a woman giving birth naturally without medical intervention? Do you believe it's even possible? Why do you think the U.S. has the highest maternal death rate in the developed world and where mortality rates are continually rising? And why do you think the U.S. has the highest newborn death rate in the developed world? Question, do you think it's because you are terrible at your job? The United States has an average hospital OBGYN C-section rate of 33%, and it ranges in different hospitals from like 17 to 77%. At The Farm, which is a famous midwifery collective run by Ina Mae Gaskin, the average midwife attended birth had a C-section transfer rate of 1.7%, which better reflects a state of actual emergency. Please explain. Is this because you view birth as a surgical opportunity rather than a natural occurrence? Is this because if women simply gave birth naturally without intervention, you'd be out of a job? Because if statistically speaking, 31% of those, let's say 33% of births are not emergencies, then what are they? Are they you needing to get home for dinner or you needing to feel like you did your job and saved the day from nothing? (laughs) Question, have you ever been at a birth where you didn't intervene and give a woman Pitocin, an epidural, an episiotomy, or a C-section? I was wondering if you could provide me with a list of all the known side effects to all of the above-mentioned interventions. I've read numerous studies with links to everything from asthma to autism. Please explain to me your rationale in using these things given such high risks. I understand that you'll likely say it's to save the baby. However, as I mentioned, if the average midwife attended birth has a C-section rate of 1.7%, then what's going on here? It seems a little bit odd. What do you think is an acceptable amount of time for a woman to be in labor before you give her some Pitocin, which is synthetic oxytocin, to help things along? Is it when you want to be home to watch the latest episode of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills? Speaking of arbitrarily scheduling women's babies for delivery, do you think there is any merit in allowing a baby's lungs to develop, which is known to be the cue which starts the labor and birth process? I mean, it's kind of handy since children will need their lungs to breathe, right? Do you think there's any relationship between the fact that children with asthma were more likely to have been induced and not brought to full term or allowed to initiate the birth process? Do you think that open-doored hospital births are a great idea? The practice whereby anyone passing through in the hallway can peep in and check out a woman's vagina while she's in the middle of giving birth. Do you think it's ideal to strap women down during labor when moving around actually helps childbirth and moves the baby into an optimal position, and lying her down increases her chances of stalling out and eventually requiring a C-section? C-sections are the most commonly performed surgery in the U.S. and in the world, followed closely by hysterectomies and cutting off baby's dicks for 40 plus years running. What's with all the cutting? Do you truly not have any other skills for healing people? It's kind of barbaric, don't you think? Question, do you routinely cut off babies' dicks when they're born? Do you think that boys and men might ever miss having the most sensitive part of their anatomy? Do you see any moral or ethical or even, I think it ought to be a legal issue, with assaulting a young baby without its consent and cutting off its dick? Foreskin tissue gets sold after you cut it off, right? So how much do you make per foreskin when you cut them off healthy male babies? 
Are C-sections and hysterectomies the procedure that make you the most money in your practice? Is this perhaps why you gear women towards having so many of them? And here are a few personal questions because I'm of the opinion that an expert ought to know how to do and be good at doing the things they are claiming expertise at. So just curious, have you ever had a cervical orgasm before? If male, do you give them to your wife regularly? Do you think that being sexually inexperienced and underfucked makes you a bad candidate for doing your job well? How did you make your babies? Did you buy them at the baby store or did you make sex? And how did you birth them? How many interventions did you have in your birth? Did you or have you ever used your or your partner's vagina for anything like sex or birth? If not, what do you think vaginas ought to be used for? And finally, do you think that the orgasmic, rapturous, pleasurable, life-changing experience of giving birth that many women experience when they trust their own bodies and refuse routine interventions is what birth was meant to be? I do. The Sexy Mama Salon is coming soon. This is my epic eight-week online program in all things holistic pregnancy and ecstatic birth because birth can and is meant to be the most pleasurable orgasmic experience of your life. And the fact that we're so far from that in our culture tells us a lot. And yes, every single woman on the planet is capable of having that experience. So check out the free video series for Sexy Mama. It is on my website and we'll go into all of this stuff much deeper. And like I said, stay tuned over the coming weeks for many more episodes on all things ecstatic, holistic, beautiful, spiritual, transcendent pregnancy and birth. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, subscribe and also leave a review and send someone else the gift of a healthy libido and an off the charts love life by sharing this episode with them. We'll be back next week. And in the meantime, many happy orgasms.